You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel, and I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. This program is brought to you by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and financially supported by 38 Churches of Christ throughout this area. You'll see their names at the end of our program today. We encourage you to worship with them whenever possible. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, I'm Jeff Scott, and I work and worship with the Middleton, Tennessee Church of Christ. Hello, I'm Mark Lindley. I'm the preacher of the Chapman Church of Christ in Ripley, Mississippi. Hey, I'm Josh McCreary. I preach for the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Mississippi. These brethren have been doing a great job all this month answering your questions, and we're looking forward to their answers to your questions today. Our first question goes to Brother Lindley. The person asks, who are the national officers of your church and where is your headquarters? Brother Lindley. The host of this program and the panelists of this program are all members of the Church of Christ. We use the term Church of Christ to refer to the Church of the New Testament. We refer to no denomination, rather we simply use the term to refer to the Church of the Bible, the one that Jesus promised to build, the one we read of in the pages of the New Testament. So I answer the question from that perspective. Who are the national officers of your church? I want to make it clear that the Lord's church belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to any man. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church. So the church belongs to Christ. He is the builder of it. In addition, He is the head of it. In Ephesians 5, 23, we have these words, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. In addition, He died for the church. Ephesians 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. He died for it. He's the head of it. He's the Savior of it. So the church belongs to the Lord. But who are the national officers of the Church of Christ? Well, the Church of Christ has no uh, officers, national officers. Each congregation of the Church of Christ is autonomous. Each congregation is therefore self-governing under the headship of Christ. We have no earthly headquarters. We have no national officers. In Churches of Christ, we do have leaders, and they are identified scripturally as elders or pastors, not an individual, but a plurality of men who are overseers of local congregations. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul is there speaking to the elders of the church of Ephesus, and he said, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Overseers. Who are the overseers? Well, the elders are the overseers of local congregations. We have no uh, national officers, only elders. We have deacons who meet scriptural qualifications found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, but we have no national officers. What about the headquarters of churches of Christ? We have no earthly headquarters. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, we find that our citizenship or conversation, in the King James translation, our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so members of the church of Christ would affirm that our citizenship is in heaven. We anticipate going to heaven where the Lord is and we anticipate being with the Lord and the saved forever and ever in heaven. I suppose we should all consider 
why some churches do have national officers and earthly headquarters. Since the church of the New Testament had no earthly headquarters, since the church of the New, Te New Testament had no national officers, we should pose the question, why do some churches today have officers, national officers, or earthly headquarters? A question that we should all consider. Thank you for this good question. Thank you, Brother Lindley. To Brother McCrary, does Proverbs 29, 18 refer to having long-range plans or something else? Brother McCrary. Well, I want to start by reading the text in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. The Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish, but whoso keepeth the law, happy is he. So the word vision in the question is used to ask, are we supposed to make long-range plans? Sometimes we say that that man is a visionary or, you know, he has great vision because he can do great things as far as planning his future. But it seems that the word is used a little differently in the context. Although it is similar, he says, where there is no vision, the people perish. It has an idea of decision making. You know, are we going to include God in our decision making process or are we not? Uh, I know that's the outcome because the second part of the verse says, Whoso keepeth the law, happy is he. A man that keeps God's word is naturally going to make better decisions than a man who does not. And you know, it, whether the, the man who does not keep his word could be very wealthy, but still the man who keeps God's word may not be very wealthy, but he's still making the right decisions and has the better vision of life. You know, vision has the idea of using wisdom. Somebody said that wisdom is the ability to see the outcome of a decision that is made. That's a very accurate description of what vision or wisdom is. But let me pose this also. We do have to be careful when planning the future. Because the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. So we need to make sure that we are always ready to meet God and that we're always including God in our decision-making processes. James talks about this in James chapter 4 and verse 13 when he said, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year. We will buy and sell and get gain. But he said, You know not what shall be on the morrow. You ought to say, If the Lord will, we should do this or that. So this man is told to include God in his decision-making process, and that is the idea that's mentioned in Proverbs 29, 18. It's certainly okay to make long-range plans as long as you know you're ready to meet God. But according to the verse, we need to have the vision that includes keeping the law so that we can have a happy future if the Lord does not come before that time. Thank you very much for this good question. Thank you. And now to Brother Scott. What is the sin unto death in 1 John 5, 16? Brother Scott. Well, this is a very interesting question. And I want us to notice as we think about the context, we look at 1 John 5, 16. And if we go ahead and put with it verse 17, we notice that it mentions a sin not unto death. And so in these two verses, we have a sin unto death. And we have mentioned a sin not unto death. Well, what is the difference and what do those phrases mean? Well, first of all, keep in mind, of course, as you probably know, he's talking about spiritual death on this occasion. You know, there have been some through the years that have thought this sin unto death was the same thing as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. But I believe those are two separate things for several reasons. One, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit involved people who were eyewitnesses to Jesus performing a miracle. And then they attribute his power not to the Holy Spirit, not to deity, but to Satan. I believe that's a totally different context from the question here under consideration. When you look back at the context of 1 John 5, 16 and 17, he is speaking to those who are New Testament Christians. He mentions, if you see a brother sin a sin unto death, or a sin not unto death. And so he's speaking here of Christians, not to alien sinners, not to Jews, and when one obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian, it is possible that that one could sin again. As a matter of fact, even after we obey the gospel and begin to walk in newness of life, we're not going to be sinlessly perfect. 
we will stumble from time to time and sadly some go farther than that and completely fall away as Galatians 5 and verse 4 warns. And so we learn that for Christians there is a sin unto death. Earlier in the same book, 1 John, we read back in chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then in verse 9 we read this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, what if we quit walking in the light? What if we quit uh, confessing our sins and we refuse to re repent of those sins? Can we remain in a safe condition with our God? Under those two circumstances, that verse would teach us it's impossible. And so one could be spiritually dead, and then later he or she obeys the gospel. They're now spiritually alive. Later, they stumble. They fall into sin. They refuse to come out of it. They're once again spiritually dead. We know that the Lord will forgive any sin that we're willing to repent of. But yet in this verse, we're told about this sin unto death in 1 John 5, 16. In other words, a sin that the Lord will not forgive. Is this a contradiction? Well, we know there's no contradiction in the Bible anywhere, so it's not a contradiction. The answer is simply this. The sin which the Lord will not forgive is not one specific sin, but it would be any sin that a Christian refuses to repent of. He refuses to confess. When a child of God goes into any sin and he has such an attitude of heart that he refuses to, to acknowledge it, he refuses to turn from it, then he will be lost. And when a Christian is in this position, it's an ugly picture indeed. Look what Peter said about it in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are, notice that word, again entangled. So this would be a Christian who has fallen. Again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. And then look how God views it. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And so a Christian can fall. He doesn't have to. And he can repent and come back. But again, as our text and as that question shows, you look at that verse in its context, and if you refuse to repent of, to confess, to make right with your God any sin, it is a sin unto spiritual and eventually eternal death. Thank you for this good question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free track. Our track today is entitled, The Predicted Messiah. If you'd like to have this track, or if you'd like to have our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, the way this works, by the way, is we'll send you the first lesson, fill it out, and send us back the back page. It'll be graded. We'll send you lesson two. If you complete all eight lessons of the course, you will receive a certificate of completion. So if you'd like the track, the course, or both, they're absolutely free. Or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can go to our website, www.abibleanswertv.org. We've got a contact page there. Also, our programs are archived there, so you can watch them very soon after they air. You can email us at abibleanswer at earthlink.net, or you can call our toll-free number, 1-800-436-0467. Back to our questions today. To Brother Lindley, uh, how do you explain Ephesians 2 and verse 8? How can works have anything to do with salvation? Brother Lindley. I appreciate the question. First, we should read the passage itself. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Scripture says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God 
not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. What does it mean to be saved by grace through faith? And how do I explain this passage? We should uh, explain all passages of Scripture by keeping those passages in context. By keeping a passage in context, I mean we should consult the immediate context as well as the remote context. By immediate context, I mean we should consider verses before and after the verse we're studying. By remote context, it may be that we need to consider the entire chapter or other passages which are connected to the verse we're studying. In order to determine truth, we have to keep passages in context. So what is the context of Ephesians 2, 8? What does it mean to be saved by grace through faith? When Paul wrote this passage, when he wrote this letter, Ephesians 2, Christians in Ephesus, those people had at some point in the past been saved by grace through faith. In order to determine what that means, we need to consider the inspired record of how, when, and where they were saved by grace through faith. Do we have that record? Yes, we do. The record is Acts chapter 19. We find in Acts 19 that the Apostle Paul actually goes into Ephesus and there he finds disciples who had been baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist. John's baptism was a baptism that would prepare people for the coming Christ and the establishment of the kingdom of Christ. But these individuals apparently had received John's baptism after it was no longer a valid baptism. They needed to be uh, taught about Christ, that He had already come, that He had died for their sins. So when you read Acts 19 and you come to verse 5, you find these words, Now when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. They had already received John's baptism, but John's baptism was not sufficient. So when they heard the instruction Paul gave, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. How could works have anything to do with a person's salvation, someone might ask. And why would anyone ask that question? Well, in Ephesians 2 verse 9, we find, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Some, reading that verse, interpret it to mean that baptism must be excluded because baptism is a work. Well, we know, as a matter of fact, that baptism was not excluded in the case of the Ephesians because we just read the historical record of how, when, and where they were saved by grace through faith. And when they were saved by grace through faith, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Baptism in the name of the Lord is for or in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2.38. So why were the Ephesians baptized in the name of the Lord? For the remission of sins. Friend, that's what it means to be saved by grace through faith. Baptism is not a meritorious work. When a person is baptized, he is actually passive in the act of baptism. He's being acted upon. He's being baptized. And he's simply responding to the love, mercy, and grace of God. A person doesn't earn salvation. We simply respond to the grace of God. And when we do that, we're saved by grace through faith by virtue of our obedience to the gospel. Thank you for this question. Thank you. To Brother McCrary, in Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, how can we reconcile the statement that the Lord is a jealous and avenging God with what we learn elsewhere about God's love? Brother McCrary. Well, in Nahum chapter 1, uh, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says that God is jealous and the Lord revengeth, the Lord revengeth, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm 
and in the clouds of the dust of his feet. So the way that we reconcile the fact that God says he's a jealous God and the Bible teaches he is a God of love is in the same way that we can reconcile the reactions of people we see on earth. For instance, I'll give you an illustration and then give you some scriptures. On your way home from work, you are ready to go see your spouse. And you can either come in the door with a bad attitude and provoke uh, feelings of anger, or you can come in the door with a good attitude and provoke feelings of love. You know, God is the same. And in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, God said, Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children in the third and fourth generation of them, notice, that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So God says you can choose. I can either be a jealous God and show a vengeful side to myself if you hate me, or I can be a merciful God to you when you love me. You know, there are lots of attributes to God. God cannot lie, which means he is all truthful. Uh, God is a merciful God, the Bible teaches also. The Bible says that God is long-suffering. There are lots of attributes to God, not just being jealous and not just being love. So the question for us is, which side do you want to see? Really, it's your choice. I'm reminded in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, the Bible says, Wherefore, re we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, fear is a good motivator, and God uses that motivator to say, I want you to see my good side. So in Nahum chapter 1, when he is speaking to the wicked, he said, God is jealous and revenges, but that's because he's speaking to the wicked. He speaks differently to the righteous, just as you would speak differently to someone who is wicked or to someone who is doing righteous deeds. Thank you for that very good question. Thank you. To Brother Scott, the person admits and says, I have a bad temper. What can I do to overcome the sin of anger, Brother Scott? Well, first I would say it's good that you recognize there's a problem. It's impossible to work on and correct anything if we don't understand something needs to be corrected. And so I would say that's a very good start and willing to admit it and notice it. Uh, is a huge first step. You know, when it comes to anger, we need to realize that it's not a sin in and of itself to be angry. Some have confused that through the years, but the Bible's very clear. You know, even God gets angry. Psalm 7, 11, He's angry with the wicked every day. Mark 3, 5 tells us about Jesus one time being angry with the Pharisees. It says, When He had looked round about on them with anger, well, why? What caused him to look at them that way? Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. You know, Jesus' anger is described for us in John 2, 13 through 17. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen, sheep, doves, and changers of the money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said to them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written of him, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Well, we know that Jesus was angry, but we also know he did not sin. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. First uh, Peter 1.22, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And so we learn from those passages, you can be angry and yet not sin. Now with Jesus, some say, well, what he had was righteous indignation. Well, that may be a very good way to describe it, but it was a type of anger. And yet Jesus did not sin. And so you think about our lives today. When we look around our country, for instance, do you see things sometimes that make you angry? And, and when you see sin just running rampant and what it's done to so many people, does it not make you angry? Well, that would not be a, a sin. Uh, that would be similar to Jesus and that righteous indignation. 
Ephesians 4.26 does give us a warning, however. Be ye angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. We can let anger get out of control. It is possible that we could lose control, and then, of course, it is sin. Remember a man one time saying that his temper, uh, it, it was bad, but it was over quickly. He, he described it being like a shotgun blast. He blew up, and then it was over. And I'll never forget his wife said yes, but look at the damage that a shotgun blast leaves behind. And that got his attention. We have to learn to control our temper. Uh, first, we can pray about it. We can ask our Heavenly Father for help. Philippians 4, 6, turn to Him. Pour your heart out to Him for help. He'll help us. Secondly, when we feel we might lose control, walk away a few minutes. Say that prayer that we just talked about. Maybe spend some time reading Scripture. It's very hard to be mad as we're studying the Word of God, reading about His love, His Son, and the hope of heaven. Thirdly, don't let it fester. As Ephesians 4.26 said, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, as soon as you can calm down, strive to deal with it instead of letting it fester and eventually boil over. Fourthly, think before you say something you may regret forever. James 1.19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And so we can be mindful of verses such as Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for angry resteth in the bosom of fools. Don't be foolish. Think about it. Put those other steps into practice. Proverbs 29, 11, A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it till afterwards. Be careful before we blow up and maybe do something we shouldn't do, but as this verse teaches, maybe say something we shouldn't say. And so while these are very simple steps, they definitely help. And I hope that that will help you as you deal with your temper. We're thankful to each of these brethren for doing such a great job today in answering these questions and questions throughout this month. Uh, they've done wonderfully. And we appreciate them taking the time to be with us. In just a few moments, you're about to see a scroll of congregations that financially support a Bible answer and uh, bring this program to you. One of those is the church at Westport, Tennessee. That's near Huntington, near Natchez Trace State Park. Not long ago, I had the opportunity to have a gospel meeting with them, and I enjoy being with them very much. I encourage you to visit with any of these whenever you have the opportunity. Thanks for watching A Bible Answer. Remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.